So, uh, good evening to all of you. We have seen uh, in the morning uh, the in the first part the flow assisted corrosion in details. We uh, looked at the erosion corrosion uh, of uh, metals. We shall continue that erosion corrosion now and then we will go on to uh, the cavitation corrosion. In the erosion corrosion we looked at the importance of erosion corrosion. We also saw how erosion corrosion can be different from the flow assisted corrosion. In the flow assisted corrosion um, it is the uh, diffusion of the corrosion product that is rate determining step. If it diffuses faster then the flow assisted corrosion rate increases and um, so the formation of the film is is uh, essentially governed by <laughs> the dissolution of uh, the metal uh, ions in the case of iron it is fe3 2 plus majorly and certain amount of uh, fe3 plus and then uh, they reform as um, a, a magnetic oxide and uh, the role of uh, uh, flow is to retard the formation of um, this magnetic oxide and uh, as the flow is uh, higher the film becomes th thinner and the film also becomes uh, rough you can say to some extent. We saw that uh, the, the, the factors that affect the, the flow assisted corrosion or material. In the case of steel um, you add chromium and it becomes uh, strongly oxide forming chromium and the flow assisted corrosion decreases. And um, the environment uh, you know what are that the pH is one, one factor. The other factor is the velocity other one is the temperature ok that we look at these um, the oxygen content ok. Um, more importantly that the, the, the flow assisted corrosion goes through a maximum and the maximum temperature depend upon with single phase or the two phase flow irrespective of the velocity that happens velocity increase of course, the erosion I mean not I am sorry this is flow assisted corrosion increases. Uh, so, so, that and uh, so, that is that is uh, this interesting thing that high temperature they do not really happen boilers they do not happen at all. The increase in oxygen content also lowers the flow assisted corrosion because it facilitates the oxide formation on the surface. So, that leads to the uh, the uh, what is called as a new water treatment called as the oxygenated water treatment in some of the boilers. Uh, the oxygenated treatment may have some problem that we are not going to discuss now here. The other effect is, um, is, is it is a mechanical effect and flow and related to that actually ok and um, that depends upon the factor like the velocity, the pressure and the, uh, the turbulence that are going to be there. So, they are all going to contribute to the flow assisted corrosion uh, and turbulence means design also plays an important role. In comes the erosion corrosion, we say the damage um, is really there is an impact and leading to uh, film damage uh, and there is a film damage and of course, the corrosion production falls. Um, over year 2 uh, increase in turbulence would increase the uh, erosion corrosion. The erosion corrosion would get accelerated when you have solid particle suspensions actually. And uh, so, that is a, a key issue 
in the erosion corrosion of metals. We saw the various factors that uh, affect we listed rather the various factors affecting the erosion corrosion and they are film formation, the film stability, other is the velocity um, and uh, the next was on the materials. We saw the film formation and film stability in terms of film characteristics <laughs> right. What are the characteristics we talked about? We talked about the hardness, resilience, porosity and you know loss of porosity rather I think, absence of porosity, density ok and the ability of the film to reform that probably we did not discuss ok. If the foreign film gets damaged, how quickly the film can reform on the surface. The next aspect that we will be discussing now is on the velocity. One thing that you might look at is we can generally say that that when the velocity increases erosion corrosion increases. But we also know that there are other forms of corrosion like pitting corrosion and crevice corrosion, they all drop when you have velocities, right. We have seen when you discuss the pitting corrosion and crevice corrosion topics. It is also necessary to understand that there is a critical velocity above which the damage is um, becomes significant, right. And this critical velocity uh, that we talk about, it is, it is material dependent, material and of course, the environment dependent. Now, uh, if you want to just uh, have a, a feel of it, ok. I just give some data here ok. How the, the the corrosion rate, the erosion corrosion rate will change uh, depending upon the on the on the materials ok. Suppose you take a say material Let us take copper admiralty brass and you can take uh, let us say C 7 0 um, 6 and this is uh, copper nickel right this is copper 10 nickel right and you also have C 715 because we need to put some zeros here ok. This is a um, copper I think 30 nickel. We also have C uh, 722 ok. And uh, this consists of some alloying elements like you may have some iron maybe some nick, uh, no not nickel iron some titanium and things like that. If you look at copper in fact, it is very interesting low velocity right. If it is going to be less than 3 feet per second, 
all our problem. You know why? You take a pipeline, you take an heat exchanger, uh, when the flow velocity is low, and they are not the right material to use. Any idea about it? What do you think? Low velocity is also a problem. See, most of the uh, process fluids uh, might have some kind of some kind of particles, you know, second particles, you know, dispersed particles. Sometimes uh, in heat exchangers, if you, if you see water, maybe some foulant. When the velocity is very low, then what happens? They start depositing on the surfaces. It's not erosion corrosion problem. It is another kind of problem that you're going to get. Okay, and uh, so you, you you normally have a problems in, in these cases. So if you can, if you if you want to rank it in, in terms of the the properties, I, I say this is this is poor. I mean, in terms of the uh, erosion corrosion resistance, I would say this is copper is. It's going to be here, okay. And of course, you can also go for stainless steels. Or titanium alloys, okay. So maybe in sea water. See. Uh, if you increase the velocity, okay, you would find that stainless steels are good, titanium are good, okay, and this could be, uh, I would say. Um, I would I would say um, moderate levels, okay, and they could be moderate levels, and it could be moderate levels, okay. This uh, this can be even be okay, okay. So these all uh, you know all these copper based alloys, uh, the velocity is maybe around about. I think probably about you know you can go up to maybe yeah about six to nine feet per second velocity that you can you can go for it. Hmm. So this is higher, okay. So beyond that, the copper based alloys would have a problem. So higher velocity means stainless steels and titanium alloys. These are the ways that you can lose, you can use it. But titanium alloys cannot be used. I mean, titanium alloys can be used, but the stainless steels of all categories cannot be used in seawater application, right? There are some problem. What is the problem there? We use a stainless steel in seawater application. What is the problem? Yeah, it could be pitting corrosion, crevice corrosion. So, you can only use a highly alloyed stainless steels like super duplex or hyper duplex in the steels or go for super austenitic gray stainless the steels. Now, if you look at the copper based alloys compared to the, the stainless steel, stainless steel is much harder when copper based alloys are reasonably softer you seen before. So, the utility of these materials are you know restricted based on the flow rate applications. If the flow rate is increasing, I think the choices are going to be much limited, okay. You go for stainless steel or, or, or titanium base, base alloys. But the same logic if you look at, if you look at a cast iron, 
and steel. So, which one do you think will be better from the erosion corrosion point of view ok. So, this is this is better this is inferior compared to that. Sometimes the velocity can have beneficial effect right. This they have reported for um, 347 stainless steels in red fuming nitric acid. They found corrosion rate drops like this may be within about let us say 12 feet per second uh, it drops like this. In the case of uh, in the case of uh, uh, aluminum alloy is slightly different corrosion rate versus velocity something like this. The reason being in aluminum alloy what happens is so aluminum alloy that you have it forms two kinds of films aluminum nitrate and the other film is Al2O3 film you are also nitric acid huh? the aluminum nitrate uh, nitrate is, uh, is is a is a salt film and um, if you increase the velocity the salt film just gets disturbed and goes away aluminum oxide is quite intact huh? so the so initially the corrosion rate increases because of the removal of uh, aluminum nit nitrate salt product. After this what happens the aluminum oxide remains on the surface and uh, subsequent velocity it does not disturb Al2O3 stable. So, the corrosion rate does not change after this. So, here so this means here removal of of L N O 3 thrice salt. The mechanism here is different. The mechanism here the stated mechanism is that the corrosion of steel in nitric acid leads to the formation of nitrous acid nitrous acid and the nitrous acid is corrosive ok is corrosive. Now, what happens the flow when there is a flow what happens now the nitrous acid is uh, removed from the surface. So, subsequent corrosion by nitrous acid is avoided. So, increase in velocity decreases the corrosion rate because uh, the accumulation of nitrous acid does not occur because of uh, the flow the velocity. The next thing that we talk about is the turbulence. Now, the turbulence can happen if the surface is not smooth, if there is a change of direction 
or if there is reduction in the diameter of the pipeline can happen. So, higher the turbulence higher is the erosion corrosion. This is very predominant in the heat exchangers. We have seen the heat exchanger uh, the overall when you discussed I think galvanic corrosion some of you might might recollect right. Um, what is that? If you recollect So, you will have lots of tubes right I think So, the liquid uh, you know enters through the header right, the shed and there is almost a 90 degree turn and it enters. The maximum turbulence they occur at the inlet right and as it travel towards inside the degree of turbulence decreases. So, the maximum damage in the heat exchanger it occurs at the inlet right. So, that is why it is called as inlet corrosion. Now, how do you really avoid this? One way people avoid is uh, they go for inserts they are called as ferrules right. So, uh, this is a tube for example, is the ferrule ok and uh, it is not necessarily do not protrude huh? they just go inside you know this thing ok. I just uh, shown it for convenience. Now, this ferrule the advantage of this ferrule is that the ferrule can undergo erosion corrosion when it gets damaged you can replace it and put another ferrule. So, the light of life of the heat exchanger significantly increases ok, but there is still a problem. What is the problem? When the fluid or liquid enters here there is going to be a small step huh? this is a small step. So, there can be erosion corrosion here. So, uh, so you need to smoothen out you need to make it like a feathery kind of uh, you know tapering off has to be done in order to reduce this uh, erosion corrosion ok. But use of ferrules are are being done. So, it is industrially is accepted practice uh, to minimize the inlet corrosion of 
it exchanges. Impingement is there, okay. Impingement is, is the direct impact. So, the impact can be high here. Huh? So, more erosion, corrosion can take place. This is impingement attack. Huh? Where uh, impact takes place, and if you are going to have solid particles, then the extent of impingement attack becomes quite significant. And these are uh, common, it can happen in gas turbines, ok. It can happen in cyclones it can happen actually right. So, some of the uh, units uh, they, they they really feel um, you know in gas turbines where, where do they happen it can happen in the, the turbine blade right. It can happen in aircrafts uh, external part it, it you know it moves uh, at a very high velocity it can happen. Some cases you can change the design and you can improve upon, but there are cases where you cannot can't change the design everywhere right, but where there is a possible um, we can change the design. For example, here you do not make it you know you increase the one way to do is that increase this radius. When you increase the radius what happens now? You will you will have less impact, less turbulence can, can, can occur. The other way of course, to visualize this is that you take this part little heavier right, you make it as thicker, where you know for sure that you are going to have impingement taking place. So, it can happen in heat exchanges you know the you know you in 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 exchanges you have um, baffles you know sometimes they hit right so it's possible that that you can increase the thickness of that you know more so that life of the overall component can be um, increased significantly so when you look at this one thing becomes clear that the design plays a very important role in minimizing the erosion corrosion right. When I say design all that reduces the impact impingement all that reduces the turbulence can increase the erosion corrosion resistance of the system. So, it is it is a design parameter as much as material parameter as well as the the environmental conditions that are operating in a given system. Let us go to materials. What should be the material property you think that uh, would give you a better erosion corrosion resistance? Should be hard. So, it should be a mechanic from mechanical properties. Uh, point of view it has to be hard yeah it is sufficient to have only hard thing what else huh? yeah operation resistance comes from hardness I mean you increase the hardness generally they are resistant to that is it sufficient to be just hard yeah. So, you should be also having corrosion resistance. Of course, that is that is in, involved in the corrosion resistance package right. 
So, in corrosion resistance, how can you how can you improve the corrosion resistance? Either the material can be noble material or it can be pass fading material, these are the criteria right. Let me give an example. Martin static steel. I given some four examples here. I can give I can, if you want I can give you even aluminum, I can give you even lead if you want. Now, let us take for simplicity uh, only the stainless steels steel family. Can you just compare and what will be your view about just erosion that damage resistance? and erosion corrosion resistance damage please you know listen to my question. You have four different type of steel, you can have two types of damage mechanism one is erosion other is a erosion corrosion. So, what will be in your view? Suppose, I take a I take for example, simply erosion right. How do you rank this one ok, no, but yeah you are right then ok. So, when it comes to erosion of course, assuming that the hardness is same I mean I, I am I am not really going to vary too many things right. Assume that the hardness of modern static steel and stainless steel are going to be the same ok. So, if you look at erosion both modern static steel and modern static stainless steel will be almost the same. When it comes to erosion corrosion, modern static stainless steel will be better compared to modern static steel. In fact, it might so happen the ferritic stainless steel may be better than even modern static modern static steel, depending upon the corrosive nature of the environment. If the environment is very corrosive, it is possible that the erosion corrosion resistance of a ferritic stainless steel could be better than erosion corrosion resistance of a modern static steel. Why? Because modern static steel generally are more prone to corrosion compared to the ferritic steel here. But the most vulnerable among all this among all this from the erosion point of view which is the most vulnerable here 1, 2, 3, 4 ferritic will be more right. Next better will be ferritic stainless steel of course, modern static steel and modern static stainless steel will be almost similar. So, I wanted to understand ok the concept of our development how it is being done. Aluminum and lead of course, if there are low velocities and we have less problems when velocity is increased then it is a problem. See this is very interesting thing it is not necessary that you can extrapolate at all velocity at a normal velocity it is possible that the lead in lead you know lead for example, in sulfuric acid the dilute sulfuric acid at static conditions at very low flow conditions lead may be good ok. Whereas, with a high velocity the lead is softer. So, that fellow will not even withstand that actually. So, it is not possible to extrapolate uh, you know at given velocities to higher because at higher velocities the, the mechanism of damage may be different is more mechanical damage dominated corrosion problems than the corrosion dominated problems. At low velocities what is the dominating me mechanism? Low velocities is corrosion at higher velocities the dominating mechanism will be mechanical 
factor actually. So, it is not possible to just make extrapolations the way you want it actually ok. I, I would like to give an example of how these things really happen in practice. The there is one of the industries uh, in India was making um, what is called as hydrogen generation unit. It was it was uh, you know they had a license it is able to uh, have engineering uh, you know capacity. This unit was I think uh, you know commissioned somewhere in the eastern Europe. The hydrogen was generated from hydrocarbon. When it when it generated from the hydrocarbon, it consisted of hydrogen plus water. Of course, there will be some amount of uh, some amount of carbon dioxide, some amount of formic acid or kind of stuffs. But these are very low uh, quantities. If I want to give hydrogen to the user, what I should do? I should I should strip the hydrogen from water, carbon dioxide, and formic acid the carbon dioxide and formic acid they dissolve in water. So, when you remove water automatically this go away right. How do I remove water from from the gas yeah you hear it you think gas will remain there <laughs> how do you do that. You are talking about industry unit they are going to produce a few tons of you know hydrogen right you can't use chemicals and all kind of stuff. Any other met method you can do? No, simple. Huh? Yeah, first of all, you pressurize. Not sufficient. Lower the temperatures you pressurize and lower the temperature what happens to water? Water will condense right the water condenses. And the air will be free from a gas will be free from water. So, the what done people do in the industries. Now, when you pressurize it you lower the temperature the water is getting separated this is a good water. So, this is now pumped and they call this as process condensate in the industry. It is a nice water no chlorides and all, but what what does it have? What, what does it have? It, it, it has carbon dioxide has got a formic acid. So, it is a pure water it is almost like distilled water. So, what do you think is property? What will be its pH you think? It will be alkaline, neutral and what do you think? Yeah. Hmm. So, it should be slightly acidic actually. Now, the whole line is under 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 a higher pressure right. So, you compress it you pump and then. So, there is a pump here it is a pump. So, there is a compressor here ok. So, this is called as a pump ok say condensate pump and this water is pumped to you can pump it to a to a water treatment unit and then to boiler you can do that ok. Now, the interest comes over here this is the pump in the pump 
the fluid goes at a very high velocity right. So, what are the process parameters? These are some of the process parameters right. You can see that uh, the flow rate is is um, 15 meter cube uh, per hour and linear velocity is what matters for us it is about 2.1 meters per second that is the velocity water goes and other parameters like you know uh, suction pressure and discharge pressure are given from the point of view of corrosion these are interesting now impurities of uh, carbon dioxide you know formic acid all the stuffs. So, the pH is between 5 to 6 the temperature is between 30 degrees Celsius and maximum of course, you can go to 40 degrees Celsius atmospheric temperatures. So, if they initially thought that in, in the design they thought that the, the pump should be made up of martensitic grade stainless steel. They were planning to have martensitic grade stainless steel. But somewhere something happened. Finally, when they just about to start the unit, they found there is a typo problem. Instead of martensitic stainless steel, they went for martensitic steel. Okay. So, they realized just one day before that this is the problem. Now, the whole unit uh, hydrocarbon unit is a part of the refinery system you cannot stop this if you stop it everything will be stopped and they start running the system now. The good point was they were having standby pump because to know you know these are the you know units that can can go bad and so they do not want the system to be uh, you know shut down unplanned shut down. So, they had a standby pump then they thought ok they probably knew that modern static steel is not same as modern static stainless steel then it start, they started operating one pump for about 3 hours then moved to another one for another 3 hours they keep on shuttling between these two things actually happening at all. So, they were little worried. So, why they are worried was that if you want to order another one it will take another 9 months it is just not possible it is not just half the self it takes about 9 months to get the to get the new one actually is ok. This is about 27 is slide is 9 right ok. So, look at this comparison of this materials now between the modern static grade ASTM A216 uh, grade is a modern static steel and ASTM A743 which is uh, modern static uh, grade I think stainless steels. The chromium is between 8.5 and 14 percent, the nickel is about 3.5 to 4.5 percent ok. Your model brinum is in this range now. Now, they are worried because modern static steel is, is really really you know corrosive even compared to carbon steels actually ok. So, what will happen? So, they started working alternatively and then they start called called one day and they said well this is a problem. It was indeed a problem. The issue here was different suppose you have pump 1 and pump 2 one pump operates other pump is standby when you keep a standby if this environment the pH about 5 is there stored the corrosion is not going to stop only erosion corrosion of course, is is reduced because there is no flow, but corrosion will not be stopping right. So, it is it is not prudent to keep the corrosive liquid getting stored they may think that there is no erosion corrosion, but there is a corrosion at all right. So, the one thing one of the thing that they can at least look at is 
monitor the thickness of the pump and see what happens. So, one thing you can do that right. Other thing that you can do is that do not start alternatively at least start one for one week and keep other one dry. So, that the flow does not corrode at all right. Otherwise, what happens you are simply corroding both of them and you are not really happening. So, what was done was they advised that ok at least do not start alternatively at least keep for about a week time and keep other one dry happens. So, then what happens then subsequently what we do is then we can make a calculations actually ok. You can make a calculation because you know what is the normal pH and all of course, it is very difficult to make exact calculation we can make some kind of comparison for this particular pH uh, what what is what is expected to happen at all. It so happened they are I mean the pump was safe for 6 months uh, by the time they can get a another unit. The point I want to emphasize here is that it looks simple between the modern static steel and modern static stainless steel, but a small error can land into a problem and can lead to unexpected failure can happen at all. So, that is something um, you do see happening in industry. This is not very old, this is probably about 2 years, yeah, about 2 years back this incident happened and uh, it was a one multinational company. It is not that um, it is some spurious company uh, dealing with this uh, system at all. So, the point that we need to be looking at is look at the corrosion plus the mechanical the hardness properties are both are important. When it comes to uh, corrosion what more property important is if the film is damaged so reform quickly if it is not forming quickly what will happen now the metal will start corroding more. That means, if I if I if I can plot current versus the time, this is the uh, passive current. If I damage here, current will rise, it can go like that or it can go like this. Alloy 1 is going to be your I 2, which is better alloy 2 is better. So, the alloy development program will take care of both the electrochemical and uh, the, the metallurgical aspect of, uh, of corrosion ok. Uh, so, that uh, we, we do not have erosion corrosion problems. So, let us give an example now. Now, you have iron chromium nickel chromium alloy. Let us take an example here assuming that the hardness properties are same which of the two will have better erosion corrosion resistance. You got my question? I am not giving other elements present here I am just giving the base uh, alloy is iron based it is a nickel based. I have chromium here and chromium here. Assuming that the harness is same, which of these two will have better erosion corrosion resistance and why? What do you think? Certainly, one will be better than other one. Do not you think so? <laughs> so, what do you think? Yeah? Nickel chromium, you, you, maybe you, you, you guessed it right or you or you figured out the science of it ok. So, let us look at the science of it. Why do you think nickel chromium is better than iron chromium? Yeah. So, relatively nickel is more noble compared to iron it is as simple as that ok. So, you have you, you find that this is certainly it is, it is, it is better. So, those cast ions which are having more nickel ok or will be better than the one with nickel free cast ions ok. Um, 
So, broadly that you can say the same is true in this case also right you take copper zinc and copper nickel right this will be better. Now, if you are going to add let us say copper zinc and aluminum suppose add to this. So, this is better than per zinc. Now, if you take let us take the case of alpha brass and alpha plus beta brass. Which one do you think will be better in terms of erosion corrosion damage? Yeah? Alpha alpha beta will be better? So, so this is where you have to look at. So, I mean alpha beta brass as you metallic guys should know right it is a two phase one right the two phase will have a better toughness better hardness compared to that actually right. So, if you look at here it is a very interesting uh, thing that can happen. The limited extent D alloying erosion corrosion resistance. No, I do not call it resistance here, I say erosion corrosion, both scales are going same manner, ok. Can you plot how this will happen? So, that is what DI is concerned, this guy will go like that corresponds to this, right. So, what will happen for erosion corrosion? Something like will go, right. Now, depending upon which is the dominant mechanism, right, if there is no flow, very low velocities probably you, you choose alloys of this, this 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 here right, but if high velocities you choose try to choose alloy somewhere here. Otherwise, instead of de-alloying they will fail by erosion corrosion damage. The other example is um, is uh, iron silicon actually you are going to have 14.5 weight percent silicon excellent material for handling sulfuric acid, especially used for impellers. You cannot use for a pipeline there right, you can use it for a pipeline and silicon alloy of this one. Can you? Can you make a pipe out of this? You cannot, it is only a cast product, you know, it is so, so brittle, you cannot make. So, it is ok for the impeller. Pump, you can do that, no problem. Pump also, you can no problem, ok. So, the silicon forms a very hard silicon dioxide, protective oxide, hard oxide. So, it is it is certainly better. You can also give an example, let us say durimate is an alloy, durimate 20 is it is a it is a made only for the uh, sulfuric acid applications actually it consists of 30 nickel, 20 chromium, 3.5 copper and uh, 2 moly. Take this versus a stainless steel like let us say type 316 stainless steel. 
this is a uh, 8 nickel 8 in chromium actually it is not 8 nickel it is 10 nickel actually ok. 10 nickel and you have about 2 moly. Durimet is far better from the uh, erosion corrosion resistance point of view. We can use nitric acid, we can use it in the sea water applications or going to be there actually. So, it is a combination of the hardness plus this is what required in order to uh, have better erosion corrosion resistance. Uh, that is a point we try to drive home uh, in the discussion. So, we have almost come to the end of the discussion related to erosion corrosion and having understood the mechanism, understood the factors affecting the erosion corrosion, you should be able uh, to uh, tell how we can prevent or you can control erosion corrosion yeah can you just what is the what are the ways that you can do that one is a material select a better material that has um, good erosion corrosion resistance that that you know how it comes out it comes out from the hardness plus the corrosion resistance properties ok. Then what is the other important thing? The material of the structures like yeah. turns and uh, so the design is is second most important thing. You can have a design to avoid turbulence you may not avoid completely, but you can minimize it actually ok. You know all this involves like you know you talked about radius ok, radius of bends to be increased and never 90 degrees that give big impact. In fact, people talk about 20 to 30 degree is what is the radius I mean uh, is, the, is the angle between the uh, between the, the turn you can talk about ok. What else you can you can look at? Yes, you can use some filters even even in the design also you can talk about using what you can use you can use you can use uh, extra like baffles you can use ok to to see that it is not going to impact directly right. Again how how do see this is not ok. ok right. So, you see that you know the fluid you know. So, the branching the way how we want to make the branches you know, there are I mean there are there are only examples they are not exhaustive by itself. Look at over design you know place place over design where the critical parts we talked about the ferrules. need exchanges. So, wherever the other way of looking at is this it is going to uh, damage impinge it should be readily replaceable yeah, you can able to replace it right quickly. So, that is also is acceptable. Yeah, you are talking about something. 
yeah what what is other alternative thing removal of uh, use of filters to the yes use the filters to remove solids you can also talk about altering the environment right pH control, inhibitors, all these stuff you can do that. You can talk about hard coatings, you can look at the time tested one what is called cathodic protection where possible. But not of course, everywhere you can apply uh, all these methods and where possible, but what is the bottom line? The bottom line is the bring down the cost right and the bottom line is safety where safety is involved right. So, uh, so these are the few available methods to um, control the erosion corrosion. Any any questions? Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Okay. This is a very interesting one. Um, if you recollect that that figure, I think these guys have see whether these people are given it back to me. It's a very interesting one, actually. You know, it's very interesting for many reasons, right? Um, first they called me and asked that what is the problem the or phone and I just asked them what is the velocity it is about less than 1 meter per second. So, this is a it is a, it's a cooling water right. So, it is a sea water and there is a cooling tower and from the cooling tower the water cools and then being pumped and this heat exchanger is quite far away from the, the cooling tower ok. So, the flow velocity of this is, is lower. When the velocity is less than 1 meter per second and it fails you do not really look at erosion corrosion as a primary mechanism right. You have seen now you know you can go up to close to about 2 meters uh, you can you can have flow velocity if it is a Cooper nickel alloy. They asked over phone and I said, okay, what can be the reason? I said maybe microbial corrosion. We didn't we not discussed microbial corrosion so far. Because sea water we thought it is microbial corrosion because when the velocity is less and there can be fouling and there is a fouling you get microbial corrosion. So, it could happen. So, went on uh, you know second time problem, third time, fourth time they got fed up and then said let us see what happened. The velocity is so low, look at this here. The velocity is 1 meter per second. Then, still, why does it happen? We looked at the water, the water had small amount of sand particles. So, the, the critical velocity is as you see from the textbook, which allows you to have about 2 meters per second, it is no more valid here. Because the solid particles, in fact, you look at here very closely, are you able to see some dents here? These are called scoring. You know what a scoring means? You, when, you, when you take you take water and you, you have this in fact, scoring is used to clean some surfaces to remove scales and all kind of things. So, when you apply a high velocity kind of thing and you have solid particles, the solid particles looks like a they abrade so easily. And moreover, there is one more problem. The problem was that when you take sea water, if you do not use filter, you as you said rightly, about 30 to 30 percent of the tubes were clogged because of some plastic, something, something happened. So, when they opened up, 
they found that these are all blocked that means what happens only remaining tubes are operating so the actual velocity is just not 1 meter per, se per second it will increase further. So, that adds more complexities to the problem. The third problem that had to complexity is if you look at the sea water the sulfur content in the sea water has been quite large ok. If you take sulfur copper is not stable in sulfur so is silver but nickel is stable in in sulfur uh, uh, yeah nickel is stable in sulfur containing where does sulfur come sulfides they come as sulfides where does sulfide come from the sulfides come from degradation of all this you send it to the sea right so many of organic matters and biofouling all this will happen. So, indirect effect is the water purity is very important ok when you have sulfur. Then there is an issue here the issue has been is failing you can diagnose this as as a, a as a denickelification I have not shown here I think somewhere I have shown I think I showed that in the yesterday when you talk about de-alloying I talk de-alloying right. Now, look at this you can look at this as a de-alloying because you have copper you have nickel you have sea water de-alloying. When is the de-alloying what is the principal problem here? The principal problem is the nickel. If I increase the nickel content what will happen to de-alloying? It will increase. So, if I diagnose the problem as de-alloying then I cannot say you increase nickel content because the nickel content is going to increase de-alloying and so the failure rate is going to be more. So, the whole lot of people were arguing that is de-alloying primarily because you see a nice green color ok and you have some kind of deposits uh, taking place. But if you look at very closely you do see that these are not ok there are de-alloying, but that is not a determining factor see there are two damage mechanisms are operating no doubt about it de-alloying is operating, but what is the primary or what is the faster damaging mechanism? The faster damaging mechanism in my view has been this is more of erosion corrosion damage assisted by these this sand particles. So, if you wrongly diagnose it you have a problem. So, finally, we went for a higher nickel anyway we, we convinced the people that to go for nickel and the tube did not fail for 3 to 4 years ok. Now, there are problems here when you say go for Cooper copper 30 nickel there are two issues if it is de-alloying one problem not only that you go to 30 nickel what is the cost of it? The cost is so high I mean increase nickel is so the cost is quite large. So, you will run the risk of failure by spending more money if you wrongly diagnose it actually ok. So, the so the root cause analysis is is, is you have to be you be have you know exercise lot of caution and when you add more nickel then the detrimental effect of sulfur comes down because nickel is more resistant to sulfur containing compound in the sea water kind of thing. So, it is doubly beneficial. So, we had lot of discussions and then of course, after 3 4 years the guy met and said that oh it is better you know, we are very happy about it. The point is that it is not going to be simple in many of the actual uh, root cause analysis because there need not be only one type of failure which are operating that can be multiple failures can happen in which case you need to find out what is the life determining mechanism that is happening at all ok. So, that is how it happened and it is a very nice thing that happened um, for those people actually ok. So, I do not want to talk more because we do not have time and uh, you want we can discuss more on this later. Let me just finish up this uh, cavitation damage and I know this we are we are already spent about uh, close to 1 hour 20 minutes right I think. Let us uh, cover this topic of uh, cavitation damage.
16 to 27. Now, uh, you know what a cavitation is. What is this? There are several persons with a mechanical engineering background, right? you should tell quickly. What is cavitation damage? So, what happens uh, like in the impellers or like we take the propeller? So, the pressure ahead and the behind is a little different. And the, when the pressure falls, the bubbles are formed because the vapor pressure is falling, so water bubbles will form. But as the bubbles move behind, uh, again the pressure will increase and the bubbles will implode. When they implode, if the high energy is there, which leads to the damage of that uh, protective film, which is there, and it can uh, take off, take the metal away. And you can see that uh, pits, the pit like structures are formed. It's very correct, ok. So, the cavitation damage essentially happens because of implosion. I want right implosion of of uh, bubbles on the surface of structure and uh, this transfers huge amount of energy onto the structures. This happens as you said uh, in impellers, in propellers, in turbines. Turbines also you compress, right? You compress it, ok, happens. So, understand how these things can happen in a uh, in an impeller, ok. You can consider a situation, I am just giving a brief account given in the Fontana book, I have not go much details actually. Okay. You can consider uh, a cylinder having water right. Sorry. Okay. So, it is uh, in contact with a tight piston right. So, your water and I have a tight piston when you move this piston up what happens? The pressure reduces right. Now, we know that the water can be boiled even at ambient temperature by lowering the pressure. So, it is possible that you can boil, you can boil the water at ambient temperature if you are going to lower the pressure. So, as you lower the if you as you rise it up, it lowers the pressure here, then what happens now? Water evaporates. And again, we reverse this. Direction. Then there is going to be compression. Then lead to condensation. The bubble will start shrinking, but beyond certain level, it can't shrink. Then what happens? Then it is going to be implosion. implores and implores then it is a it is a shock right. It exerts a pressure as much as 60,000 pound per let us 60 psi something like that we can say and this pressure
pressure exerted can lead to plastic deformation. How can you um, verify there is a plastic deformation or not? Yeah, shape fine, but change see the small bubble, you know, it won't change the shape so much. Huh? It could be a dent, yeah, it could happen, but but dent can happen, and, uh, you know, you could simply corrosion also can have a, you know, a dip. But with the plastic deformation, how can you do it? Metallurgist should tell. What do you see? You will see a slip step. If you are going to look at this in the microscope and you see nice deformed layers, right? You see slip steps that is indication of uh, the plastic deformation of a metal. To summarize that to cavitation to occur, it must have a region of low pressure where the liquid will evaporate and then the evaporated you know vapor will be subjected to a higher pressure. The pressure is sufficient enough to condense and lead to implosion and that leads to the plastic deformation of the material. If you look at the mechanistic point of view, we want to draw, draw some kind of schematic diagram of what happens in the material all the metals are covered with some oxides right like this it form a bubble here when you increase the pressure what happens bubble uh, implodes, this gets damaged. When the area is getting damaged, then it gets corroded again right. Now, what happens is very interesting now, the formation of the bubble over here is much easier right, because it gives you additional surface. So, the bubble can go and rest on this, then what happens? Then again implosion, film damage, and what happens? Then there is going to be again corrosion, film formation, then again again starts right, again bubble will come and form surfaces, so it starts continuing process. So, the, the pit grows primarily because the surface becomes rougher it becomes easier for the bubble to sit on the surface. Please notice that the very implosion by itself is not a problem. If it happens within the liquid, I have no problem. It happens only in the surface, it causes the damage. So, the cavitation damage that is occurring here more of a mechanical damage and corrosion is a consequence of the removal of the film, exposure of the bare metal to that and again the further damage comes by a mechanical process implosion of the bubbles. Of course, corrosion occurs why? Because the environment interacts and then forms the film and so on and so forth.
Now, this also you know um, there are of course, several examples it can happen. Uh, this also depends on the design. Suppose uh, I have a pipeline like this, they want to join on to this pipe actually, they reduced like this. Now, look at this design here it is a pipe the larger diameter smaller diameter you welder like this. Where do you think the cavitation damage will occur yeah just at the reduction area this is the reduction area right. Because the pressure is increasing. So, such kind of design you know mistakes you should be avoiding the impeller you cannot do anything right the, the, the impeller works on that pr principle only there is a suction you know, the pressure is increasing you cannot do anything, but these designs are you can be avoiding it actually. Yeah, where? Here. Yeah. If, if you are going to if you are going to um, if the same liquid has to go through this of course, the velocity will increase. Huh? Here this side ok. Of course, um, you also have to understand I understand your point huh? you have P 1 and P 2 unless this pressure is uh, lower the value of L 1 will not will not come into this place here ok. Okay, because you, you, you know otherwise the liquid go in another direction actually ok. Um, so, so, what is the reason why you get the cavitation damage here? That is not implosion that is ok. The pressure decreases here ok. So, pressure decreases here and then starts imploding here. The pressure decreases then the bubble starts no it does not form. The bubble forms only when the pressure increases. When this decreases it is not evaporates. The liquid evaporates ok when the pressure is dropping when the pressure decreases ok. What would of course, can happen is that the bubble so formed earlier you can uh, you can just you know uh, uh, explore probably can happen because if the pressure inside is more than outside. See what I understand implosion is that when the pressure is more outside the bubble then becomes implosion. If the pressure inside the bubble is more than the pressure outside the bubble then becomes a explosion it just goes bubble becomes unstable actually ok. It expands. Huh? Yes, because the bubble always condenses and then it just uh, does not sustain the, the diameter of that ok. I can I can get back to you on this actually. I talk to this many people will do this, but surely this is the place where you have problems uh, for sure. So, how do I control the control of this? One of course, is hard materials. Coatings no you know of stellate coating copper containing coatings you can do that. <laughs> you can also have resilient coating 
see the resilient coating what does it do it it, it just uh, does not lead to plastic deformation right. And you can also have um, it also means like rubber lining for example, you can do that you can have smooth surface. What is the advantage of smooth surface? It does not allow the bubble to stick on the surface and use inhibitors. The fact that inhibitors reduce cavitation damage means there is a corrosion taking place simply not a mechanical damage per se. Okay. So, um, that should uh, come to the end of discussion unless you have any questions.